Uh, my name is Pat Yon Pradit, and I have a gift for you. I saw a lot of you were taking out your phones and uh, snapping pictures of Bart's wonderful slides. And I know how uh, that could be tiresome after a while, so I've given you the slides themselves. So this is a QR code to my LinkedIn, because not only did I put my slides there, but I put my main points in there in case you forget what I say and you want to review them later. But actually, I provided a link to my, uh, my LinkedIn because I actually want to interact with you um, after this keynote. So even during this keynote, you can ask questions, uh, put your takeaways into the comments uh, for that post, uh, or you can just grab the slides as well. Um, I also put some links into the, uh, to the, uh, the comments so that you can uh, just click on those versus having to, to type on things, all right? So that's a, that's a QR code to my LinkedIn where you'll see this keynote presentation. And I'll show that later. So a little bit about me. Um, I hail from Washington, D.C. And uh, before I uh, became the chief academic officer for Code.org, I was a teacher. I taught for 13 years in uh, mostly secondary school, middle school and high school in the US, actually in Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, this is a picture of me uh, with some of my students. And uh, I always show a picture of me and my students because it reminds me of what we're doing here. All of us, whether you're in higher ed or primary or secondary education, are all about students. And so it's wonderful that you're coming here to figure out how to do your jobs better so that you can serve your students better. I am the chief academic officer for Code.org, and if you haven't heard of Code.org, Code.org is a civil society organization, a nonprofit organization based in the U.S. with international uh, influence. And our vision is that every student in every school has the opportunity to learn computer science and AI. The problem is, in the U.S., but also internationally, there are still hundreds of thousands of students who couldn't take computer science, computing, informatics, whatever you call it, even if they wanted to. And in an age of AI, computer science, informatics, computing, it's more important than ever. So, with the AI hubbub for over the last, what, two, yeah, about two years now, um, a group of organizations got together to decide to do something to guide education leaders and policymakers. So five organizations got together and created an initiative called Teach AI. You can visit it at teachai.org. The whole purpose of Teach AI is to guide education leaders and policymakers in rethinking uh, our education systems in an age of AI. The goal is not to integrate AI in education, but to transform education potentially using AI. And I'll talk about that potentially later, but certainly using AI as a context. And those organizations are Code.org, ETS, ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education, Khan Academy, and the World Economic Forum. There are actually um, over 100 advisory committee organizations including informatics societies from around the world, including Brazil, Portugal, Spain, as well as the World Bank, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, but even OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, etc., all working together. And we're called Teach AI because we believe in teaching with AI and about AI. I'll talk about this. If you're new to AI and education, this is an easy way to categorize what AI and education is all about. Let's start with teaching with AI. Teaching with AI is all about using it as a, as a tool across various subjects. It could be teacher support, it could be for student learning, it could be for school management and operations. Here is a video of uh, the teacher tools available at Khan Academy. And this is a particular teacher tool, uh, a lesson planning tool, which is a, oftentimes a very tedious aspect of, uh, of teaching. Um, and so in this case, 
they're using a wrapper on top of ChatGPT to prompt uh, the development of a lesson plan and actually refine that development of a lesson plan based off of interest in Taylor Swift, actually. So that's one example. Then there's teaching about AI. Now, a teaching, a, teaching about AI often gets overlooked because AI itself is a discipline as well as uh, it has connections with lots of other disciplines as well. Those disciplines could be informatics, ethics, mathematics, psychology, etc., etc., etc. In fact, many of you don't teach AI mainly, but you do teach AI as part of another subject. And so how AI works comes from these subjects and more, but knowing how AI works helps you use it more effectively and responsibly. Knowing how AI works helps us get beyond the superficial layer of understanding the ethical and social implications of AI to get to the deeper understandings, the deeper ramifications, and understanding why those, things, why those things are issues. We'll talk about some of those issues in a sec. But let's get to this main point of AI literacy and talk about what it is. So what does it mean to be AI literate? Well, it means many things. And in fact, a number of people around the world are working on this, including Teach AI, which is working on an AI literacy framework with global partners. So look out for that. But what is AI literacy? It's first off recognizing the presence and role of AI all around us. You know, AI, generative AI especially, is being woven in to so many different things. I was, uh, I was on my phone today and taking a picture and thinking about uh, the role of AI in just creating the standard picture that I have. So not even a filter, not a special feature. In fact, the new Google phones, uh, you're able to prompt an image model inside the photo app and change the background altogether. So if you have one of those new Pixel 9s, you can do that. And that's obviously generative AI, but there's already AI involved in just taking a picture. So no longer, you might think, no longer do we have the ability to tell the difference between fake photos and real photos. Guess what? Your photos are already fake photos. So recognizing that is important. But also, deciding whether an AI approach is even a responsible approach for a problem. That's AI literacy. Understanding how to formulate a problem. My colleague at King's College London, uh, Oguz Akar, talks about the difference between prompting as a problem-solving technique and problem formulation, which is actually more significant and more durable in an age of AI. Because, you know, as we've seen over the last two years, prompting gets easier and easier and easier. What else is AI literacy? Understanding AI's capabilities and limitations. Now, Bart did this thing where he had you raise your hands, and uh, I don't want to embarrass anyone, so you can just raise your hands in your head for these next two questions, all right? <laughs> but the first question is, have you used a generative AI tool at all? That's the first question. Okay, and some of you raise your hand. Okay, great, wonderful. You don't have to, all right? The next question is a little bit more personal. I know there are a lot of educators in this audience. Have you, you don't need to raise your hand, okay? <laughs> but have you given official guidance to your students on how they should use AI? Have your institutions done that if you've done that? Who knows, right? That is what builds AI literacy, just understanding when to use it, when not to use it, the capabilities and limitations critically evaluating AI's outputs, which, by the way, differ between subject. Because if you're in computer science, computing, informatics, the use of AI is going to be very different. Plagiarism is going to be very different because it's almost, uh, it's almost required when you're coding to plagiarize from other uh, bodies of software um, uh, knowledge. But uh, when it comes to uh, a creative writing piece, uh, using an AI chatbot, to create writing and text is, is very different. So ultimately, what does it mean to be AI literate? We're going to talk about the how AI works side today. And we're going to focus on informatics. Now, 
I'm going to focus on informatics because I want to move away from the general AI and education topic. You know, I cannot wait till the day when we're moving beyond the idea of is AI good, is AI bad, or is AI both in education? Uh, because the fact is, it's everything. It's good, it's bad, it's extremely bad, it's extremely good. And we have to get very nuanced, not just within a particular subject, but also use cases within that subject. And so I'm going to talk about informatics, and I'm going to talk about how the informatics community is engaging and wrestling with AI's role in the informatics classroom. But since I'm a teacher, I have to start off with a little AI literacy for you, which is a brief introduction into how AI works. Now, I apologize if you are a professor of artificial intelligence out there, because I'm going to oversimplify. But I know that there are some people in this audience who've probably listened to webinars, podcasts. You might have even spoken about AI to other people. But you really, really don't know how AI actually works. So I'm going to hit it at a high level just to set the stage for the rest of our conversations over the next two days. Because I was actually reading the, uh, the, um, the schedule, and I saw that there were seven breakout sessions, seven breakout sessions, all about AI in some way, explicitly. And of those seven, there were 39 papers. In fact, a number of you have written papers about AI. So again, I apologize for this oversimplification. So let's start off with a definition. AI refers to programs or machines that simulate tasks that typically require human intelligence. You might think, boy, that's super broad. It is super broad because AI as a field is just a super broad field. So you have to actually get deeper. And so whenever you're defining AI, it always pays to talk about key examples. And these are three key examples. Making predictions, generating content, providing recommendations. Notice, I didn't say anything about making decisions. And that's a key thing that I do not do because I don't want it to, I don't, I don't want to ever be accused of anthropomorphizing AI or lifting AI's role above the human role because we are the ones who are going to make the decisions or should make the decisions. AI can provide the recommendations, AI can make the predictions, but I'm the one who's going to make the decisions. So if you're an educator using AI as a grading tool, you need to be the one making decisions. So in talking about AI, it helps to start off with a simple program. Imagine a program where a student is learning. Uh, uh, imagine a program that um, asks you what your symptoms are because you're coughing, and then asks you subsequent questions. And imagine these if-else, if-then questions, and if-else, if-else-if questions being nested, and imagine hundreds or thousands of these, you can imagine that this simple program could start to approximate medical expertise. But the problem is, I had to type in everything all myself, and it can only do one thing. This is called classical AI, AI from the, the 50s and 60s. But then came along this idea of teaching machines to learn patterns, and we call this machine learning. And this is the basis for the AI, much of the AI that we know today. Now, it's not the only technique in AI, but it is the predominant technique right now. And it requires really big computers. So it couldn't really happen in the 50s and 60s. We had to wait till computing power caught up. And then we have to give it, rather than the rules, we had to give it algorithms for learning relationships among pieces of data. Lots and lots of data, in fact. And so the machine is now learning all these relationships itself, and that is the basis for what we see as autocomplete te uh, text, video recommendations, email filters, translation apps, etc. Machine learning. Now, how did we get to generative AI? Well, we go through the, the technique of deep learning, which is basically you can just consider it really, really strong machine learning. And you give it all the data on the internet, and then you can get large language models, the ability to model language itself. Now, this is the key point, folks. A lot of students are using generative AI these days. I was reading a Digital Education Council survey report from just July 2024, and they said that 86 percent, 
and I think this was mostly higher education, 86% of students are using AI. 58% are using it weekly, and 24% are using it every single day. And the thing is, I bet you a number of them don't really realize what a large language model is. In fact, 69% of you use AI uh, to search for information. And here's the problem, and I know that some of you all know where I'm going with this. A large language model is not a fact machine. It's not a fact proxy machine, in fact. It's just for the, it's just for the purpose of creating language that is plausible, that makes sense. That's why it's a large language model. It models language. And so the output is about modeling something that makes sense and looks like fluent language. That's why when you use a chatbot, you're like amazed by it. Wow, it's so fluent. Yes, that's what it's designed to do, but it's not designed for fact. And so it's a problem when 69% of students who use Gen AI use it to search for information. So generative AI has a lot of issues with it. And it's much more than just text. It's image, videos, etc. And the issues relate to transparency and explainability, trust and accountability, etc. But now you know why those issues are issues at a technical level. For example, transparency and explainability. I showed you the, that fancy picture of all those algorithms. But those algorithms and the relationships that they create among data, the programmers don't even know what's going on. They don't know what's going on. It's a totally different way of programming where you didn't type in all the rules yourself. That has issues with transparency and explainability. There are also issues with bias, because guess what? If you're pulling large and large amounts of data, you know where I'm going with this. You know that there's a lot of bias in that data. There's a lot of racism, sexism, et cetera, in that data. Do you think that the AI model creators are able to filter all that out? No, you, you actually can't. And in fact, in some cases, you may need that sexist data, because depending on what you're asking, the AI chatbot, it's information. So that's where the bias comes from, and now you know some of the technical underpinnings. Let's talk about what it means in the informatics classroom. Here's a tool that's being used very often in informatics classrooms. It's the GitHub Copilot. In fact, you can find this type of tool. Uh, you can actually use ChatGPT it itself to do this kind of thing. But writing unit tests in an in informatics classroom can often be a tedious uh, aspect of the coding process. So why not use a chatbot for that? Here's the problem. If you can ask a chatbot to create a unit test, which tests code, you can ask it to create the code itself. What's stopping kids from just cheating? In fact, forget cheating. Why is it important to learn to code anyway if a chatbot can do it? It seems to do it pretty well, right? Well, this question was asked of NVIDIA's CEO, Jensen Huang. He was asked this very question. He was asked, so what should kids learn, what should kids learn in an age of AI? Let's, let's see what he said. Let's move to a non-AI related topic for a second. I want to talk about education. So today, knowing what you know, seeing what you see, and being at the cutting edge of this technology, what should people focus on when it comes to education? What should they learn? How should they educate their kids and their societies? Well, wow, excellent question. I'm going to say something, and it, it's, it's going to sound completely opposite um, of what people feel. Uh, you, you, you probably recall, uh, over the course of the last 10 years, 15 years, um, almost everybody who sits on a stage like this would tell you it is vital that your children learn computer science. Um, everybody should learn how to program. And in fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. It is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program. And that the programming language, it's human. Everybody in the world is now a programmer. This is the miracle. This is the miracle of artificial intelligence. For the very first time, we have closed the gap, the technology divide. So you might be thinking, oh, wait. Pat, why did you show a video like that? It makes it seem like the whole point of your, of your keynote doesn't have a point in an age of AI. Well, first off, Jensen isn't an educator. Uh, and, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a point. 
Now, educators could look at that and think, no, it's still important to learn to program. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just a, a tech CEO. But the fact is, is that he does have a point. And what all academic communities should do these days is question, why are we teaching what we're teaching in an age of AI? And so we're going to get into how the informatics community is wrestling with some of these questions, starting with that question. Why is it still important to learn to program? Again, I'll be talking about computer science, computing, informatics, but I want you to think about your fields, whether it's a humanities field, a STEM field, et cetera. Why is it important to learn, to teach what we're teaching? In fact, you should ask, your questions, ask yourself the question, what is the most important thing to teach? And then ask yourself the question, is it still important in an age of AI, and what else might actually be more important? So let's look at what the computer science education, education community is doing. The first thing that they're doing is realizing that, you know, for AI, for robotics, for cybersecurity, for data science, for a lot of things, computing remains fundamental. It's foundational. It teaches things like ethics, algorithms, data programming. So just at a base knowledge level, it's required. It's important. It's foundational. But what is foundational now? That's the question. What is foundational? Is the coding aspect of informatics still as foundational as it was? And so a group of people got together, from all over the world, in fact, to create this guidance on the future of computer science education in the age of AI. And Teach AI partnered with the Computer Science Teachers Association, which is a global organization for computer science teachers. And the purpose of this guidance was to realize the benefits and mitigate the risks of AI in computer science education. It was to broaden participation in computer science education and figure out how to use AI towards that goal. The purpose was to modernize computer science curriculum and instruction and not shy away or bury our heads in the sand when it comes to AI and its effect on computer science. But it was also to provide an example for other disciplines. So you could imagine that you could erase the word computer science or informatics and include your subject. So are you thinking about this? Is your academic community think about this, thinking about this as well? Let's take some quick lessons learned from the computer science community. Starting with number one, we addressed multiple myths in this guidance. And the first myth is that AI coding tools make programming knowledge and skills unnecessary. And the fact is, is that uh, in an age of AI where kids are using these AI tools, the AI tools don't make learning to code unnecessary. In fact, learning how to code at a foundational level first helps you use the AI tools better. And so this is the, the common situation between does AI replace a task or does it augment a task? And in fact, with coding, you're going to see a little bit of both. This is what I mean by the nuances. So if we're still, as an academic community, as a global academic community, thinking about whether AI is good or bad for learning, or will AI replace or augment learning, that's still too broad. We need to get more specific. We also dealt with this particular myth. AI can program accurately and independently. Sorry that this got uh, cut off a little bit. Um, and that's a myth, because as we know, code generators produce correct code between 31 and 65% of the time. And even if they were perfect, the purpose of coding is not just to create the code. You have to embed the code within an existing larger program. And AI can't do that yet. Here's another myth. AI will replace all programming jobs. The fact is, is that AI will shift the focus of programming jobs. It will change it. And yes, some aspects will be de-emphasized, like rote coding on your own. But code reading, evaluation, debugging, and refactoring, these things will be more important. Now, how does this impact your discipline? Well, let's say you teach a language. Let's say you teach creative writing. Well, maybe the, the aspect of there are certain aspects of creative writing that will be de-emphasized. Should ideating and just coming up with ideas be de-emphasized? 
should that be emphasized and actually writing drafts, that should be de-emphasized and editing is emphasized, right? It changes different aspects of the creative writing process. Here's another myth. The only pro purpose of learning to program is to produce programs. And in fact, learning to program is very different at the primary and secondary and tertiary level than the professional practice of programming, which is mostly about producing programs. Because when you're learning to program, you're learning many other things as well. You're learning logic, you're learning how computers work, you're learning, the, you're learning persistence, resilience, you're learning collaboration as well. And so the reality is that programming promotes many other things, including creative expression and even just discovering joy, human agency in creating things ourselves, powerful things. These are important aspects of programming that go beyond just creating a program. AI coding tools are the only way to use AI in the informatics classroom. You know, as you saw that there are some tools that I put up above, these aren't the only types of tools that you can find in the coding classroom. So that's a myth. And in fact, teachers, this was a, a survey from the guidance, teachers understand the uh, intricacies of using these types of tools. And they actually uh, uh, are kind of, um, they have mixed opinions about introducing them uh, to novice students, which is a good thing. That's per the coding tools. But those coding tools are not the only types of tools. This is one of my favorite tools that's out there right now. It's out of Harvard's Creative Computing Lab. It's called Block Talk. And it uses a generative AI chatbot to simulate helping a student debug their own program. And so the teacher is actually typing in these things and, uh, with a, a simulated student. And it helps a teacher practice their debugging conversation pedagogy. So the only coding tools are not just the actual code generators. You can have teacher simulations as well. And this obviously applies to other subjects. A couple more myths. Informatics teachers don't want to teach a new topic. We might be thinking, oh, you know what? They already have so much to teach. Well, in fact, they really do want to teach about AI. And you might be thinking, well, that's obvious. They're informatics teachers. Of course they want to teach about AI. But do English teachers want to teach about AI? Or do these informatics teachers, do they want to teach about the other aspects of AI, like the ethical and societal impacts? The answer is yes, they actually do. It's a myth that they don't want to teach about larger, more broader societal aspects of computing. Because we ask those same teachers whether they're teaching about bias, misinformation, etc. And guess what? They are. And actually, most of these computer science teachers discuss AI ethics with students weekly or monthly. They're really leaning into this. And other academic communities need to lean into this too. So I'm going to end here with a, a couple, uh, with, with this quote, and then a call to action for you all. This quote is from the board chair of the Computer Science Teachers Association, and basically Charity says that as a computing community, we need to understand our opportunity and responsibility for leaning into AI and teaching about the broader implications of AI, not just the technical aspects. That goes for you too, whatever your discipline. If you're already teaching about ethics and societal implications, teach about the technical side. If you're teaching about the technical side, teach about the other side as well. We all have a role to play in AI literacy, not just informatics teachers. So in conclusion, AI literacy, yes, it requires informatics. Teachers need to understand how AI works so that they can teach kids how AI works. But it goes beyond informatics. AI literacy requires you all as well, whatever your subject. I'm going to have a workshop after this that's going to go into the details of how you can implement AI in your discipline, how you can implement AI literacy in your discipline, understanding that not all of you are informatics teachers. Though, by the way, I, I looked at some of the tracks. I'm very excited to connect with my informatics and computing peers out there. But AI literacy requires all subjects. So please connect with me. Connect with me if you just want the slides. I'd love to hear your takeaways and your questions and what you learned from this. And also, attend my workshop, attend Bart's workshop later on, and attend all those other sessions about AI sprinkled across. Thank you.